In the darkest corners of the human psyche, evil can take root. It can lurk, hidden, waiting, until it compels you to commit unspeakable acts. The Devil Made Me Do It case is a sinister tale of possession, exorcism, and a chilling courtroom battle. Join us as we delve into the abyss of the supernatural, where demons walk among us and innocence is just a facade. Prepare yourself for a journey into the heart of darkness, if you dare. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Crime Weekly. I'm Stephanie Harlow. And I'm Derek Levasseur. And as I think most of you could tell from the teaser, we are doing a case that fits in with the Halloween season. And I was happy to be able to convince Derek to do this because I know how scared he is of ghosts. And I don't love ghosts. I do want to go see the new Exorcist, though, but I don't love ghosts. But you wouldn't go to the Conjuring house in Rhode Island? No, not the actual house. No, absolutely not. (laughs) Absolutely not. Haunted house, all those things. Yeah, for sure. I just, like I said, I mean, there's certain things. I don't mind murderers and all those tough guys, whatever it is. Like, you can physically see them. You're both human beings. Mm -hmm. You start messing with the, you know, other dimensions. Mm -hmm. They got the upper hand. I don't like that. So do you believe in ghosts? I do. I told you that before. I absolutely do. Or I wouldn't be scared of the conjuring house. Like, I do believe there's things out there. And I think that there are good spirits and bad spirits. And I think if the bad ones want to mess up your day, they can. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. So I didn't know if you actually believed in ghosts or it was just kind of a thing like they could be real. And just in case, I'm not going to mess with it because that's kind of how I am. Like, I don't know what I feel about God or an afterlife or what happens, you know, after we die. But I try to be a good person just in case. <laughs> just, yeah, I agree. Just in case. Yep. You never know. And I think there's a lot of stuff out there where, you know, these ghost hunters, they're not all bad, but like there are a lot of them are just making shit up. But I feel like there's definitely something out there. I feel like there's some things that happens to human beings that are unexplainable, that there's just no way this person in their right mind would do it. I even think there's a possibility that some of the most hardened criminals that we see out there, these demonic people that you're like, how could they do this and and, and function while doing it? Could it be something taking them over and, and that, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Who am I? So, yeah, I'm not going to find out, though. But I'm not going to put myself in a position where after the fact I'm like, I shouldn't have done that because now things are falling off my walls and shit's happening and I can't go back. So, no, I'm good. I'm just going to. I mean, you can go back. You know, you can have an exorcism. That's what I'm saying. See, do I want to do that? No, I don't. I don't want to go back to the house. I don't want to do that. I'm just going to avoid it. Like if I don't bother them, like a life experience. You have no. to have an exorcism at least once in your life. Bungee jumping, skydiving. Those are once in a lifetime experience. The slingshot, right? Those are once in a lifetime things. <sighs> don't even talk to me about the slingshot. But, too. <laughs> but I'm not. It's an inside joke from CrimeCon. But I'm not. Yeah, I just that's not something I'm going to go. You know what? I never went into a a house that might have been possessed by evil spirits. I'm not. I'm. I'm not going to be mad about that. I think I'm going to get you to go into the Conjuring house just once. <laughs> I better lots be heavily have, sedated. Lots of people have gone in and, and they're fine. They're that's great. Law of I'm going to be the unlucky okay. son of a bitch that's not okay. Because you're a true believer. Like Derek went crazy after this. What <laughs> happened to him? And you'll be telling the story in your spooky little teaser voice. Yeah, it's definitely a Halloween material. Yeah, you, you should be like, this is great for the clicks. <laughs> I'm going to record every single moment of you in that conjuring house too. So I have the moment and the no. spirits will like recognize you and they'll be like, oh, he believes. Yeah, no, I'm his, good. His mind is perfectly primed to be taken over. No, I'm good. I'll pass. But, you know, listen, I'll, I'll support you in spirit. You can FaceTime me while you're in there. Let me know how it goes. They can get you through FaceTime. I mean, that's obvious. Okay. So now I'm not FaceTiming you either. There we go. <laughs> so <laughs> like less. you, like you, I believe in ghosts. I believe in residual energy, negative residual energy hanging around. I think you can definitely feel it. I've been in ha- houses that are said to to be haunted. I felt it. Um, and I and I believe that there's something out there. And like you, I think that a lot of of times when people are going in with like EMF and spirit boxes, it's just, you know, it's for entertainment. And it is fun. Like I won't say it's not fun. It is fun, but it's not always the case. And so for for this story, I think at the end we're gonna have to, I guess, ask ourselves the question, which I didn't ever think we'd have to ask on Crime Weekly, was this person truly 
possessed by something dark and nefarious? Or was that just an excuse that was used to try and get away with murder? It's a great question. You had gave me the summary of the story before you decided to do it. And I was like, this is a great time to do it. So I'm looking forward to it. And I think before we do, can we can we at least hit it with a positive note first? Sure. Okay. If you're watching on YouTube, you're probably already seeing it. If you watch Crime Weekly News, you already saw it. Stephanie and I are rocking the new Crime Weekly merch, or two of the two pieces from our, our, our recent drop. We launched these things at CrimeCon. It was an exclusive to CrimeCon at first. Now it's available to everyone, and you can get it at CrimeWeeklyPodcast.com. Just click the shop button, and you will find this item here, which I'm wearing. If you're, if you're listening on audio, you just have to take, me up, take my word for it. But it's basically the Nothing Burger. Right. That's my whole shtick. Right. But they added on to it. Jane R. Marketing added on to it and they gave it like a whole a weekly meal, they call it. So you have lies instead of fries and then uh, cold hard truth for your soda, your shake, whatever you're into. And this is my favorite shirt. I think it's awesome. I think the burger's ridiculous. And uh, yeah, mine was mine was did well at Crime Con, but definitely not as well as yours. Yeah. So I'm going to have to get up and. You, know, you got to do your modeling thing again. You got to do it. <laughs> I already did this for That's the best news. part is just seeing you struggle. <laughs> I was struggling. <laughs> I was struggling around the mic right here. So I wanted to, you to pay it back. But yeah, that shirt's, so that yes, shirt's great. This shirt was the best selling one at CrimeCon. It went so fast. It says Crime Weekly, Sofa Division. The O in Sofa is a... You know this one. You just did it. Microscope? <laughs> nope. Magnifying glass. Magnifying glass. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> and then the O in division is a thumbprint, but the best part, my favorite part, is the back. And here's where I stand up awkwardly. <laughs> yeah, this is why you have to go over to YouTube right here. Watch that cable get all tied up. Oh, I'm splitting. Can you, you gotta see move it? your hair? Oh, oh shit. Am I in frame? Yeah, there you go. So I can describe it because her she's Thank not you. next to the mic. It says solving crimes from the sofa. Since 2020, which is when we started our podcast, you have the couch in the middle there wrapped in caution tape. It's a really fire shirt. It's a great shirt. So we have these two shirts available on the website. We also have the Crime Weekly logo, like our original shirt, in white on the website. And we have the Crime Weekly logo in a baby blue hoodie, which is sick. It looks awesome. And we're going to be adding things to it. So... There's some of you that were DMing us saying like, oh, I can't find these items that you're wearing on the on the Bonfire website. I'm going to be shutting that down really soon. Right now, you have some of the Crime Weekly stuff. You have the undercover pineapple shirts. All of that stuff is going to be re-released with newer designs, better quality t-shirts, better quality material. It lasts a lot longer. And we'll be adding new designs as we go. So again, that's crimeweeklypodcast.com. The website's the older website. We got we to gotta do some work on it. We're going to be changing the whole thing over. It's going to be a complete overhaul. But in the meantime, go there, click the little bar, the menu in the top right corner if you're on your phone or if you're on your web browser, it should be more visible, but just click there, click shop. You'll see the items right there. JNR marketing will be fulfilling them like they fill, fulfill our criminal coffee merch. The stuff's great. If you're interested in it, go check it out. Okay. So here's the gist of the case. In 1981, 19-year-old Arnie Cheyenne Johnson pleaded not guilty to the gruesome murder of his landlord and friend, 40-year-old Alan Bono. Initially, the Brookfield, Connecticut police claimed the motive for this murder appeared to be connected to a jealous love triangle. But within days, a bizarre story began to emerge, told mostly by Ed and Lorraine Warren, self-professed demonologists. The Warrens expressed their belief that Arnie had been possessed by an evil entity when he had stabbed Bono more than 20 times. And these claims would have normally been ignored by law enforcement if not for the involvement of the Bridgeport Diocese. Priests from St. Joseph's Church had been called in after hearing that 11-year-old David Glatzel had entered a rental house in Newtown in July of 1980, where he was confronted by an elderly man who would later appear to David as a red-skinned beast with horns and cloven feet. David Glatzel was the brother of Arnie's fiance, 26-year-old Deborah Glatzel. And Deborah, along with her family, supported Arnie's possession claims because they had seen evidence of it and they'd lived in hell because of it for months. According to reports, the church had performed three lesser exorcisms on David Glatzel. And during one of these, Arnie had challenged the dark forces inside of David, commanding them to leave the boy alone 
and take him instead. Lorraine Warren would later say, quote, That night, Arnie made a big error challenging the demon. He never realized there were so many demons in the boy. End quote. According to the Warrens, 11-year-old David Glatzel was inhabited by 43 demons who had spent months attempting to convince the young boy to give them his soul. We were contacted by Father Dennis, who at that time was pastor of St. Joseph's Church in Brookfield, Tony. Mm -hmm. And the call came in, and he spoke about a young boy <clears throat> who he had been trying to help, but recognized it as a case of possession. He told me that he was very leery of becoming involved in this case mm -hmm. because he had been assigned by the bishop to exercise another home, but this was not of an individual now, of a home that had infestation going on that we investigated. And when we got in the house, we were sitting there at the table talking. Now you would watch David and he would be doodling, you know, drawing or something like that. And he'd be concentrating on what he was doing. And then he would look up and it was no longer a little 11 year old boy. Now this 11 year old boy would become extremely strong. I seen nights when it would take four and five men to hold him down. He would be ranting and raving, raving and uh, yelling. Uh, there was times when he would attack his mother. Now this boy loved his mother. He loved his father. And uh, at one time he actually broke the mother's nose, I believe. Arnie Johnson, who was a young man that was engaged to his, uh, his sister, Debbie, would help every night to control the boy. He'd come home from work, he was a landscaper, worked very hard, and uh, he'd have his supper, lay down, but then just around 11 o'clock was when this would occur to David. <clears throat> As Lorraine said, all of a sudden, you'd look at him, he was normal, the next second, it wasn't David anymore. And uh, this would go on until the sun came up. Uh, the boy would roll around, uh, he would go into fits. Uh, I seen one time when he actually levitated, had extreme strength, uh, terrible obscenities would come from him. And Arnie Johnson, uh, who was a young man, who I would call probably uh, an all-American boy. He loved sports, he was into baseball, he had many awards for baseball. He loved fishing and uh, he and Debbie, his fiance, who was David's sister, would go off fishing and they'd have a good time. But this kid, 18 years old at the time, would stay awake all night long and then go to work the next morning. But he made a fatal <coughs> mistake. One night he said, and he, he screamed at these devils, mm -hmm. take me on, leave my little buddy alone. He, well, challenged. he got his wish. He, he challenged the, he challenged, the demonic. He challenged the demonic. Now, by this time, Tony, into the case, the Catholic priest were already involved. Father Dennis had left for Ireland. Another young priest was assigned to the parish at that time, and another young man who had just recently been ordained mm -hmm. was also assigned there. They came to visit us, and the two of them finally it grew to having six priests involved in it. Six priests. Three of them. Three of them. From the Vatican. Three of them ordained and wow. schooled in Rome, these men. And they were very frightened of the things that Arnie would say. He was such a compassionate young man, such a low-key person. Never once did I see him show any type of violent behavior. He was a perfect gentleman. Mr. and Mrs. Warren this, everything. Just a beautiful person. Tremendous respect for the priest. If you were going to have a son, he'd be the boy you'd want. Yeah, that's the kind of a boy he was, Tony. Mm -hmm. But he made that fatal mistake. And of challenging. Challenging the devils. And I know that one of the Catholic priests even met with him to talk with him because he was so concerned about his welfare. Mm -hmm. And because, like you say, he challenged it, Tony. And remember, 
that when you challenge the demonic, it doesn't act at that particular given time, Tony. Mm -hmm. It waits until you are the most vulnerable, mm -hmm. and then it strikes. When Just you least sus sus suspect it. So the stabbing of Alan Bono would actually be the first murder in Brookfield's 193-year history, and it would also mark the first and only time in U.S. history that demonic possession was officially used as a defense in a murder trial. The murder and the trial, which would become known as the Devil Made Me Do It case, was the inspiration for the third Conjuring movie and has become a part of American history and lore. And uh, I will say, I like the Conjuring movies. I like the first one. Um, the third one, the, the one that this this case kind of inspired, not, not the best, not the best of the Conjuring movies. Given the material of this case, given the very, you know, real things that allegedly happened, I'm not saying they were real, but I mean, the people recounting them told them in such an illustrious and specific and detailed way that the third Conjuring movie should have been amazing. And it just, it was really weird, really weird. I have a question for you because I found that clip really, really interesting. And if you guys are listening on YouTube on audio, then it, you still get the same thing. But seeing them and seeing their, they sound believable. But what what is your opinion? Do you believe that what they're saying there, as far as the boy David Getzel uh, Glatzel levitating, do you do you believe them? So that was Ed and Lorraine Warren, right? That's Ed and Lorraine. Yep, exactly. Yep. Um. <laughs> Do I, I think that they sound believable. Yes. Don't they? They really do. They, they do. always do. And the fact do. that they had a bunch of priests there, some from the Vatican. I mean, they, they, did have, they did have many priests. And that's kind of why this case was taken so seriously in a legal arena because of the Catholic Church and their involvement. Three lesser exorcisms. So this is not a lesser exorcism is not a full exorcism. So I actually bet you didn't know, but you've already had a lesser exorcism by being in this relationship with you no <laughs> i mean I, have i how that would baptism? actually be a positive thing if i exercised yes. your demons but a, a uh, baptism a baptism is yeah. considered a, before, a lesser yeah. exorcism so anybody who's baptized in the catholic church has already gone through a an exorcism so a lesser exorcism is not you know it's not what you would see in the exorcist it's not you know this very intense thing where the person's like having a like ton of people holy holding water them down and they do throw holy water on you. <laughs> holy water is always going to be a part of it. But it, to the Catholic Church, it's just like less extreme, less urgent. It's where they're going to start. Um, in fact, the Catholic Church often does exorcisms on houses that supposedly have, you know, dark forces inside of them. So the fact that the Catholic Church took part in an exorcism is not as crazy as somebody yeah, right. might think you know they they do that i don't know if they do it much anymore i do know they still they still do it but it's just the fact that they seemed to take it seriously that that caused the police and then obviously the legal system to to look up and say okay well we have to kind of consider this at least yeah i'm interested to hear what you guys have to think about this one i found them believable without knowing all the details of it and their backgrounds just on the surface. They didn't seem like they were over embellishing. They didn't seem like they were sensationalizing it, like flailing of the hands aren't very calm, collected, and and sounded like they were, were, you know, pulling it from memory, not just something they were making up. And their stories together were consistent, which you could argue was because they've worked it out in advance. But they're putting a lot of other people, like we say with criminals, right? When you have co-conspirators, the last thing you want to do is involve other people because then the story you create can be contradicted by those outside witnesses. So for by them putting in six priests and Arnie and his sister, Deborah, by putting, I'm sorry, Arnie's fiance, Deborah, by putting them all in the room and allegedly experienced and witnessed those same things, um, you have to have that many more people on board with your story if it's not true. And the, the more people, the harder it gets. So for me, at this point in the story, pretty believable. We'll definitely want to hear from you guys. Well, that's kind of the thing. Um, there was a lot of people who witnessed this, right? So not just yeah. Arnie, not just Debbie, David's mother, Judy, David's two brothers, uh, even his father eventually 
the priests, neighbors, they all had some sort of experience with this alleged possession. And yes, I will say that it sounds like they're believable and they may believe what they're saying. And that may mean that it happened or that may mean that they believe what they're saying. <laughs> I do I do think that Judy Glatzel, who is David Glatzel's mother, definitely believed what she was saying. I don't think she made it up. And there's evidence that even before the murder, these people were reaching out to priests and talking about this possession. So it's not as if, I guess, the murder happened and then they said, oh, we've got to figure out a way to explain it. And then they said, oh, let's just say Arnie was possessed. You know, there was evidence that even before this murder happened, months before, as you said, I think seven months earlier, July of 1980, the murder happened in February of 1981, Months before this, these things were happening and the Glatzels were reaching out to the church and asking them to help. The Glatzels were reaching out to the Warrens and asking them to help. So, yeah, there it's I believe that some of them probably believe it happened. Now, does that mean it did? I don't know. Yeah. When Stephanie says, oh, you said that before, that was actually when we were just talking about the case off record. But we were kind of adding up the months of mm-hmm. where, you know, this incident occurred with Arnie in 81 and when this exorcism took place where Arnie challenged the demons in 80. So, you know, talk about a six, seven month window where after he challenges them, it starts, it doesn't happen right away. And then this is where we end up in a situation where they're referring to him as the all American boy, this person you would want to have as a son. And then he goes on to stab someone 20 times. It's, it's a big yeah. jump if there's nothing in his past and he's doesn't have any history of this. Well, how does he get to that point? And if you can't, if you can't pin it on demons, then we have to find that tangible thing that happened in his life that would allow us to understand, okay, yeah, he was in a good place, but this or this happened and threw him off. Is there something that we can go back to and say, yeah, this is where he took a different, you know, direction in that fork in the road. If there's absolutely nothing, I think that's when this idea of a demon taking over him becomes more plausible for some people. Yeah, I will say uh, from from everything we know, there was nothing. No right. issues with the law, no violent behavior ever. No as issue far as anybody could tell. No, as far as any, they, they were very in love. As far as anybody could tell, he was just incredibly level-headed, responsible for his age, uh, which is a good guy. Didn't have a temper, nothing like that. Didn't have a problem with alcohol, drugs, nothing. Uh, that doesn't mean he didn't do it, right? But I think then we'd also have to say, okay, what was his motive for killing Alan Bono? If that was his friend, which everybody who knew them said these two men were tight, very good friends. So what causes somebody to stab their landlord and very good friend that many times just out of nowhere? Something would have had to have happened that was intense enough and impactful enough to trigger that. So, yeah, I agree. That is where the issue of of possession comes in. Like, is it possible something took him over? Um, it's yeah, it's very it is very interesting case. And I'm so going to really have fun doing this with you because usually I, I talk tell. about things like ghosts and possession with skeptics. And it's just not fun to, to talk to them about that. But you actually believe it could be possible. And so do I. So this is going to be fun. Believe it could be possible. But the question we'll have to answer by the end of the series is, is it enough to use as a defense? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think mean, it's a different question. Well, we'll let's get there. take a quick break and we'll be right back. Financially, a lot of people are struggling. The state of the world is not great. There's inflation. Prices of everything is going up. And most of us are saddled with debt that we've been carrying for years and years and years. How many of you wish there was a better solution to paying off your debt? PDS Debt has customized options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills. With rising interest rates and the cost of living at an all-time high, now is the time to finally take initiative with your debt. Stop waiting and start saving with your own custom debt savings options from PDS Debt. PDS Debt is giving our qualified listeners a free debt savings analysis just for completing the 30-second online debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash crime. You will receive a full breakdown on how to save on interest each month and the quickest way to take care of your debt. 
If you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances aren't going down, this program is for you. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low monthly payment, and everyone with $10,000 or more in eligible debt qualifies, and there's no minimum credit score required. Bad and fair credit are accepted. You can save thousands in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time with PDS Debt, and Derek's going to tell you how. That's right. PDS Debt is offering a free debt analysis to our listeners just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at www.pdsdebt.com slash crime. That's pdsdebt.com slash crime. So it allegedly all started on July 3rd, 1980. And this all centers on the Glatzel family who moved to Brookfield, Connecticut in 1969, and they lived in a one-story ranch home less than a mile from Route 7. In 1980, Judy and Carl Glatzel had four children, 26-year-old Debbie, the only girl, 14-year-old Carl Jr., 13-year-old Alan, and the youngest, 11-year-old David. All of the children lived at home with their parents except for Debbie, who was living in Bridgeport at the home of a single mother named Mary Johnson. Now, Mary's life had not been easy. She had three children of her own, and she had adopted her niece in 1971. That same year, she'd been diagnosed with an aggressive form of colon cancer. Unable to work as much, Mary began taking boarders to help pay the bills. And for those who are not up to the old-timey lingo, a boarder is you know, basically like a roommate, but somebody who rents a room in your house and then they have access to the living areas like the kitchen and the bathroom and stuff, but they they just rent a room in your house. And a lot of people would do that back in the day if they couldn't pay the bills, if they weren't able to make ends meet, they'd have to bring somebody in for some extra money. In 1976, Debbie Glatzel, a young woman who worked as a dog groomer, moved in. Debbie would become very close to the Johnson family, going above and beyond to help with finances and to help with the younger children. And her kindness and selflessness was one of the reasons that Mary Johnson's oldest child, Arnie, eventually fell head over heels for Debbie. During the four years that they lived together, Debbie and Arnie grew very close. And by 1981, they were engaged and they had plans to marry the following fall. The happy couple were intent on getting out of Bridgeport, however, which I guess had become somewhat of a dangerous area with a rising crime rate, and they began to look for a house that was big enough to accommodate themselves as well as Arnie's mother, Mary, her two daughters, and her niece that she'd been raising as her own child since the little girl was a baby. They wanted somewhere outside the city that was close enough for Debbie to commute to her job in Newtown that accepted dogs and had some land for the kids to play on. And in April of 1980, they saw a listing in the Bridgeport Post for a house available to rent in Newtown. The house was located in a rural setting, and the owner had told them it would be ready in July for them to move into. Because Mary Johnson was getting sicker from her cancer, Arnie and Debbie had decided that they would handle the house expenses, which would be $550 a month, including utilities. And Mary and the kids would live in the main house while Arnie and Debbie occupied the in-law apartment. Yo, you got to love the 80s. $550 for an entire house with land and an in-law apartment and utilities included. You can't even get a garage for that right now. I was hearing it and it just demoralized me. I'm like, okay, never mind. It's real rough these days. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, just for the the past couple of years, honestly, like even, you know, buying a house, renting an apartment, anything is just astronomical and it's it's ridiculous. So to see that five hundred and fifty dollars a month. Wow. Times have changed. Now, Arnie Johnson was a young man who was known to be quiet, steady tempered, well mannered and extremely compassionate with a great sense of responsibility for those he loved and cared about. Born in January of 1962 with bronchial pneumonia, Arnie had not been expected to survive, but he was strong and he did survive. And from the moment he could walk, Arnie was basically looked at as the man of the family because his father and Mary's first husband had left. They weren't together anymore. He wasn't around. Mary had remarried. She had Arnie's two younger sisters. That dude left too. So it was basically just her taking care of all these kids. And Arnie, obviously, as the oldest child and the son, felt responsible for helping his mother. Mary raised Arnie and his siblings as Baptists. They went to church every Sunday, and Arnie was literally a choir boy, right? He sang in the choir, went to Sunday school, all of that. And as a child, Arnie played Little League baseball and worked as a paper boy. 
And one year for Christmas, Arnie used his earnings as a paperboy to purchase a used car for his mother so that she wouldn't have to walk to her job as a cleaning lady at the Holiday Inn. Arnie had dropped out of school in the 10th grade so that he could get a full-time job and help provide for his family. He was working as, you know, doing landscaping and things like that, whatever he could to bring in money. And at the age of 18 in 1980, Arnie had never been in trouble with the law, and he was not a man that anyone could say they had bad blood with. He didn't get into arguments, he didn't get into fights, and overall he just seemed like a nice man who was looking forward to starting a life with the woman he loved. Arnie and Debbie put down an $1,100 deposit on the rental house, which was every dollar that they had, and they planned to move in on July 2nd. On that day, Debbie and Arnie arrived at the Newtown house with boxes early in the morning, along with their happy-go-lucky dog, George. Around 1 p.m., Debbie's mother, Judy Glatzel, arrived with lunch, and she had brought her three young sons, David, Ellen, and Carl, with her. While the adults unpacked and cleaned up, the three boys began to explore the house, and they seemed very interested in a back bedroom that still held a massive waterbed the previous renter had left behind. The boys began having fun on the bed, wrestling with each other and making so much noise that their mother had to enter the room and tell them to cut it out and start helping by carrying boxes inside. They all left the room except for 11-year-old David, who remained behind. David would later claim that as he stood at the foot of the waterbed, looking out of the window, he felt two hands suddenly and forcefully push him down onto the bed. He landed on his back on the waterbed, and when he looked up to see who had pushed him, he found himself face to face with the figure of an old man who had a menacing look on his face. But the most terrifying thing about this man was that David claimed he was transparent, meaning that David could see through him. According to David, the man slowly lifted his arm and pointed at him, saying one word beware, before vanishing as quickly as he had appeared. David would refuse to enter that room again after that, although he didn't tell anyone what he had witnessed at the time. But later that afternoon, his brothers, Carl Jr. and Alan, they were sent back into the bedroom to grab some boxes, and they would later report that something had happened to them as well. When they tried to leave the room, the door suddenly slammed shut, and no matter how much they pulled on and turned the doorknob, it would not open, and their shouts and banging brought no one to their aid, even though the others in the house should have heard their cries for help. The door did eventually open after the two boys had pounded on it for a couple of minutes, but they too were not big fans of going back in there after that. For the rest of the afternoon, it was reported that David Glatzel was grumpy, and he kept to himself. He refused to eat dinner, he wouldn't talk to anyone, and he retreated to the solitude of his room out hours before bedtime. Later that night, while he was in bed, he whispered to his brother, Alan, who shared a room with him, and he confessed what had happened earlier. David said there was something wrong with that house in Newtown and claimed that for some reason he could still see the entity that had appeared to him, even though he was tucked into his own bed miles away. David told Alan that the thing was still in the Newtown house with the dog, George, and George was running around the house acting crazy. David watched as George ran down the stairs to the cellar and began in a panicked way scratching at a locked door down there. The house had not been ready to move into that day, so Arnie and Debbie had returned home with the Glatzels to spend the night. But now, Alan told David that he should probably let his sister and her boyfriend know what he was seeing at their rented house because they were planning to move in the next day. David told Arnie and Debbie about the old man and his sinister warning. He said the man was still talking to him and showing him what was happening at the Newtown house. The entity would go back and forth between the back bedroom and the cellar, and when George the dog saw it, his eyes turned red and he began to run in circles. But the thing that had appeared to him as an old man earlier no longer looked the same. Now, David claimed, this entity, this thing, his body was all red, his face was big and white with dark holes for eyes, and he had horns growing out of his forehead. So when David told them this story, you know, that he could see what was happening at the Newtown house, that he could hear this old man who no longer looked like an old man talking to him in his head, she became nervous and she whispered to Arnie that they might need to figure out what was going on before moving right in. And they should call his mother, Mary, and let her know that they would be delayed in moving in because she and the children were scheduled to arrive the following morning. As Debbie spoke, David began staring off into the distance as if listening intently to something. And then he informed his sister that the man had just told him they would under no circumstances be telling Mary Johnson anything. Mary should never know he existed because he had been interfering in her life for a long time. He was going to break her down and get her to do his dark bidding. So if they told Mary anything, they would all be sorry. 
Arnie, Debbie, and David all later claimed that they were warned, and if they didn't listen, Debbie would be blinded by midnight the following day. When Debbie pushed back against the thing that David was referring to as a ghost, she basically was like, this is ridiculous. Like, why are you saying these things? Nobody's talking to you. Why Why would he be saying this? We, of course, have to tell Mary. So she starts kind of like pushing back and getting a little agitated. David once again paused and acted like he was listening to something. And then he claimed the ghost man began laughing and told David that Debbie would see the next day. Arnie Johnson claimed that at this moment he began to shake and a terrible cold came over him all at once. It only lasted a few seconds, but it shook him to his core. And David, noticing Arnie's change, informed him that the ghost man had been responsible for the cold. And he had done this to show Arnie and the rest of them that he was in control now. And if they gave him any more trouble, he would cause unrelenting chaos in the Glatzel home. Debbie Glatzel remembered being shocked at what her brother was saying for multiple reasons. First of all, David was not the sort of boy who let his imagination run away with him. He wasn't interested in anything connected to ghosts or the supernatural. He didn't even like horror movies. Debbie was sort of the one who was into that stuff. She had actually taken a course, I believe it was an elective in high school, about, you know, spiritualism. She had purchased a Ouija board, kind of interested in it. I mean, it was the 80s. Everyone was interested in Ouija boards. I had one. I think I had two. And I remember <laughs> never being able to fall asleep with it in my room. So I'd have to get up every night and take it and then put it in the um, the hall closet where all the towels were and then go back in my room and then I could sleep, but I could never sleep with it in my room. So th- totally understandable. But Debbie saying, David's not into this stuff. You know, he likes playing outside. He likes drawing, but he's not like a super imaginative boy. And he's really not into ghosts, horror movies, things like that. Secondly, David had a slight learning disability that he received extra help for in school. And one of his big issues was vocabulary and spelling. But now he was using large words like unrelenting and pandemonium. And when his sister asked if he even knew what these words meant, David responded, no. He just heard the man say them in his head. And he'd simply repeated the words. First question to you. Again, I'm going to ask this a lot throughout this episode. Do you believe this? I mean, is this something like, what if Bella or Aiden started doing this? Like, what are you doing in that situation? Because I'm th- I'm putting myself in these shoes of Debbie and I'm thinking, I, I might be running. <laughs> I might be gone, man. I might be like, <laughs> we're, I'm out. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much what she's saying, right? Which actually surprised me because I would be more skeptical at first. I'd be like, come on, man, like cut it out, right? But Bella says crazy shit like this all the time, by the way. (laughs) She always does. Bella swears that she sees a man in our Four Seasons room all the time. Okay, okay. So never going to your house, noted, got it. She And she's not scared about it, but she just says it weirdly in passing. Right. So she's not coming in. She's not trying to get a ton of attention. She'll just be like walking out of the Four Seasons room and headed to the bathroom. And she'll be like, the man's in there again. It's like nothing. The man's in there again? <laughs> yes, dude. It scares the crap the out of me. The man's in there again? Stop. It Sell scares, the house. Scares the crap Sell out of me. Sell it. What and, room is uh, this again? The Four Seasons room. Didn't um, you just redo that room? We just redid that room. Oh, well, so you like pissed, last him, year. You pissed yeah. him all the way off. Yeah. You changed the room? You changed his room, man. <laughs> Oh, my God. Poking the bear. Wow. Yeah. No. Okay. Has she said anything since then? She says it all the time. Um, since you changed the room? Yeah. Before she's and after. She's made comments like, oh, he's not happy about you changing the room. No, no. She doesn't. She doesn't say anything about his intentions. She just says he's in there. Um, he's in there. And, and dude, I will say like our dogs, especially Doc, uh, the bigger white one, who's the only the only male dog we have, he will often be in that room and then he'll just start looking over towards the 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 kind of sliding door that goes out into the patio and he'll just start growling and he Mm-mm. won't stop. Mm-mm. And it annoys me so much because at some point I'm like, okay, you see a ghost, man. Enough. Stop growling. Cause he does this like low, like, like in Could his he be seeing an throat. animal in the backyard? I don't know what he's seeing, dude, but it's so annoying it's probably and, because an it animal. scares the with crap out of me every time. And then he won't stop. And it's just this, it's like a very menacing sound. You, you have to like, especially you being a researcher, you have to ask Bella what this person looks like. And I have. Start looking at the history of your house and see if anybody matching that description. She says he wears past. a brown suit. She she says he has dirty shoes. She's got descriptions. Damn. Does she see him anywhere else? 
No, only in the Four Seasons room. That's terrifying. And you know what else is weird? We brought like we went to the Renaissance Festival this past summer, and they had like a that's a weird little, too. They had a little psychic fair there, and so I I went to one of the psychics, just like you know this will be fun. And Bella wanted to get hers read, and this dude the psychic said no. This dude was sitting with her for like thirty seconds, and he said, "Oh, she's different. She's different." <laughs> <laughs> I swear God. to God, man. I swear to God. He's like she's different. He's like she's um, she has a very there's a very there very there's a very thin veil, uh, and there's there's figures angels. He said standing behind me, and they're protecting her. She's meant for something in this world. She's supposed to go out there. She's going to do something very important. She's going to be a person who makes a, a positive change, and she's going to have the power to do this that nobody can really understand. And he said when she tells you things, like she sees things or she senses things, if she gets a bad impression about somebody, listen to her. She's only six. But she's special. She has a a sense. She can sense things. And I was like, I didn't tell him about the 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 ghost man. But I was like, da- like I got goosebumps right now <laughs> like, yeah. because he he like thirty seconds and he you know and it could be just a thing. Maybe they do that to everybody. But I had mine mine right after. And He's even like, during my, no, even during mine, he was like, okay, you were put here to protect her. Like it was all about her. <laughs> so I was like, damn. <laughs> so yeah. Do I believe it, man? I I don't know, but it's a lot of people to be telling the same story. Yeah, and I think also the other children seeing it. Okay, I'm trying to look at everything here objectively and like take it at face value because again, I don't know the history of these people. I'm just going off what we're here, what we're what we're talking about tonight. And so just going off these stories, you have multiple children feeling or seeing or hearing the same thing. And obviously they're gonna know what. The, they're going to know the vocabulary for David. Uh, that's a, that's the main thing for me. Where yeah. if, he, if, if Tenley or Peyton started using words. Unrelenting they, and pandemonium. Yeah, <laughs> when, yeah, when I do their reading and spelling with them every day, you know, and they're struggling to spell difficult. So it's like, yeah, those things would throw me off where I'd be like, where the hell did you hear that word from? Now it's, I heard it from YouTube. But before that, you know, you don't know where they heard it from. So Yeah, if Bella said, oh, the ghost man's going to cause unrelenting pandemonium, I'd yeah, be out. moving out. Puppy. Yeah, you're out. Sell so far, he seems pretty benign. He's chilling. But the, but the second she starts saying unrelenting pandemonium. Yeah, if he pushes you out of bed or something, you got to go. For sale sign. You got to go. <laughs> so let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. You all already know that I love Skims. I'm wearing a Skims bra right now. I've been obsessed with their Fits Everybody collection, which is the butteriest, softest underwear ever. So I wanted to try more from the brand I'm always seeing. And what I'm also always seeing is their cotton loungewear all over my feed. So I had to check it out for myself and see what all the hype was about. And let me tell you, they did not disappoint. These are the cutest and most flattering sets you'll find for in or out of the house. When they say that the cotton collection is for inside the house or out, they're absolutely right. When I went to Florida for CrimeCon, I flew on the plane dressed in skims basically from head to toe. The hype is real. I've never felt this cute and comfortable in loungewear. I've been wearing it everywhere, running errands, chilling at home, sleeping, traveling. I need a set in every color. And in fact, I do have a set in several colors at this point. I have a set in gray and black and the uh, the green and the blue. And I just love it. The, the green and the blue is mineral and kyanite and they're beautiful. So I've got the cotton rib leggings, the cotton rib thong, the jersey scoop bralette. These are all things that I've been wearing on the daily and the cotton collection is Skim's most tagged collection. It's made with classic cotton fabric for comfortable everyday wear and it's made from ultra soft and natural fibers. The cotton collection features elevated lounge pieces designed for comfort indoors and outdoors. And if you want the most flattering leggings, the cotton rib leggings will fit the bill. And whoever said loungewear was only for the house hasn't tried Skims. These Skims cotton collection is available in sizes extra, extra small, 2, 4X. I mean, I can't say enough about it. You guys know, like I said, I'm wearing the cotton collection scoop a lot right now. I love it. So comfortable. So cute. Derek's going to tell you. I can check it out for yourself. Believe the hype. Skims has over 100,000 five-star reviews for a reason. The cotton collection and more are available now at skims.com. Plus, get free shipping on orders over $75. And if you haven't already, be sure to let them know that we sent you. After you place your order, select podcast in the survey and select our show in the drop down menu that follows. That's extremely important. So go check them out, guys. Skims.com. So 
So the next morning was July 3rd, and a night of sleep had not made Debbie any less reluctant to move into the Newtown house. She told Arnie that she believed David. She believed that he had at least picked up on something that had scared him, and Arnie agreed with her, but he also told Debbie, like, what choice do we have at this point? We put every dollar we had into this house. We got to try to kind of make it work and investigate a little bit, see if there's anything behind this. They tried to get into contact with Arnie's mother, Mary Johnson, but it appeared by the time they called, she'd already started the trip from Bridgeport to Newtown. So Arnie and Debbie got in their car and headed to the house in Newtown to let George out, the dog, George the dog, and to, you know, finish unpacking and just kind of figure out what's going on, get a feel of things. When they arrived, Mary Johnson wasn't there yet, and George the dog did not start barking, as he usually would when someone approached the door. Now, Arnie and Debbie claimed they found George inside. He was laying on the living room floor as if in a coma. His fur was matted and dirty. He had urinated on himself, and his two front paws were caked with blood. They also discovered that the inside of the front door to the house and the outside of the locked cellar door were covered in scratches from George. So George was trying to get into the locked cellar door, and he was trying to get out of the house. And as they took all of this in, Debbie basically threw her hands up, and she was like, okay, this is settled. We can't move in here. This is exactly what David saw last night. He saw George scratching at the cellar door. He saw George panicking, running around in circles. This dog's clearly been through something. Arnie claimed that as Debbie said this, he felt a firm tap on his shoulder twice, as if someone was standing behind him and tapped on his shoulder twice. But when he turned around, no one was there. Mary Johnson, his mother, arrived with the children as Arnie and Debbie were deep in this conversation, and she had some bad news. She said she had signed the lease that morning and given the landlord the deposit money, but she'd been told that utilities would not be included in the rent, and that was really all Debbie needed to hear. They had budgeted carefully, and the only way that they were ever going to be able to afford the monthly expenses on the house was if the utilities were included, as had been advertised in the paper. And this, on top of what David had said and what happened to George the dog, showed them that moving into the Newton house was probably not in the cards for them. Surprisingly, a normally passive Mary pushed back angrily. She said she didn't believe in ghosts, and they didn't need to move in if they were scared, but she was going to. She seemed aggressive and agitated in a way that Debbie and Arnie had never seen her act before. And this made Arnie remember the previous day, the first day they'd been at this house, when they'd walked in and Debbie had uncharacteristically snapped at him within minutes of being inside their new rented house. And Arnie was kind of like, Debbie never does this. She never raises her voice. She's usually very, you know, chill. And she had started kind of like shouting at him and getting very irritated with him. And so Debbie and Arnie kind of decided that the house caused people for some reason to feel animosity and to act out. And so they got in their car. They left Mary Johnson, who refused to listen to them, and they drove to the Glatzel house, arriving around noon. 11-year-old David was waiting to greet them. He said he had known they were coming. The ghost had told him. And he had also been told by the ghost man that the man was very angry with Arnie and Debbie because he knew they had tried to warn Mary Johnson about him. So the next day, Debbie and Arnie would talk to the woman who had rented the house before them. And this woman would admit that she had also experienced some strange happenings in her time at the Newtown house. She said sometimes at night when she was lying in bed, she could hear someone calling her name. And other times she could hear chickens clucking outside. But there were no chickens and no one in the neighborhood owned any chickens. Many nights, she would hear footsteps in the attic above her. Lights in the house would turn on and off by themselves. Doors would open and close. And she had once found what she called a profane altar in the locked cellar room. And this led her to believe that some sort of evil witchcraft had once been performed there. This woman claimed that these things would always happen at 3 a.m. And several times, she had heard someone calling her name. And this was followed by the sound of breathing in the room with her. She said that at that point, everything in the room would suddenly go still before she felt whatever was in the room get into bed with her, moving the covers, depressing the mattress, everything. So here's the thing about this woman. Her name is Michelle. And remember when this ghost man told David Glatzel the first night, like, oh, um, if you guys keep messing with me, if you don't believe what I'm saying to you, I'm going to make things happen. Debbie's going to go blind by midnight tomorrow. And he also said that the waterbed in that back room would spring a hole, that he would make it basically, you know, 
spring, get a hole in it. And so when Debbie and Arnie were talking to this Michelle woman, she was actually sitting on the waterbed in that back bedroom. And when she got up, there it, the waterbed started leaking because Michelle had had a screwdriver in her back pocket because she was removing the rest of her stuff from the house. And the screwdriver, when she'd sat down, had punctured the waterbed, causing it to spring a leak. So I don't know what you want to make of that. So, so for me right there, I don't find that like compelling at all. Because okay. I, I would cough that up to just a, a physical thing of a coincidence where if he's going to do something, if the spirit's going to do something drastic, it's not going to be, I'm going to poke a hole in your bed. It's going to be something more severe, like I'm going to blind you. Like that to me, if if Debbie woke up the next day and couldn't see, I'd be like, whoa, okay, well, she's walking around with yet. I'm just saying at this point, if you said to me, Debbie can't see anymore right after this was said, that's compelling to me. But the fact that... It's explainable, right? She had a screwdriver in her back pocket. There was a justification for the screwdriver because she's removing furniture. She's getting her belongings. She accidentally sits down on the waterbed. She punctures the waterbed. Mm -hmm. That's an easy thing to go back after the fact and claim, oh, the spirit told us they were going to puncture this small hole oh, in I the see. waterbed. Yes, yes. So I, I can explain that away where you could say after the fact, oh, they he said this was going to happen. So that's for this one. Not as I'm not as like jumping off my seat on that one. Okay. The poked hole in the waterbed. Not doing it for me. Well, after Ernie and Debbie talked to Michelle, they were like, nah, we're okay. We don't want to hear chickens yeah, we heard fucking enough. outside at night. Yeah, yeah, we heard enough. We don't want to hear somebody calling our name because the woman said- tapping us. Yeah, the woman said that the, the thing didn't just like call her name like Michelle. It was like, Michelle, you know, real creepy. We don't want things getting into bed with us at night. We're all set on this. So they gathered their things. They moved out of that new townhouse that day, even though they really never moved in. But they they took their stuff and they were out. But they could not convince Arnie's mother, Mary Johnson, to leave with them. So she and the children remained behind. After speaking to the previous renter, Michelle, and leaving, Arnie and Debbie once again drove to the Glatzel house where they would be living until they figured something else out. And once there, Judy Glatzel told them that things were kind of strange. Carl Jr., David's older brother, he was acting very rude and angry. He'd been yelling at everyone all day, uh, especially David, who he was calling names, saying, like, you're crazy, you're seeing ghosts, you're going crazy, things like that. Kind of just using language that he wouldn't normally use, being aggressive and just, like, mocking in a way that he normally wouldn't be with his brother. And apparently Carl Jr. was hiding on purpose and, and jumping out to scare David. But worse than that, David had told his mother that the ghost man was still talking to him. As Judy was filling Debbie and Arnie in, David entered the room looking pale and scared. And he said, he's coming. He just left. He's coming to get me. So the Glatzels and Arnie claimed that David got more and more panicked as he spoke out loud, tracing the ghost man's journey from the Newtown house as he headed across town towards the Glatzel home. Suddenly, David's eyes got wide, his mouth fell open, and he backed away, saying the man was there. And then all of a sudden, everyone who was standing in the kitchen heard three sharp raps on the door, causing them all to jump out of their skin. Of course, nobody was on the other side of the door. That night, all three boys were sleeping in the same room so that Debbie and Arnie could use Carl Jr.'s room. And when Debbie went in to say goodnight to her brothers, one of them accidentally stuck their fingernail into her eye. Debbie had to go to the ER that night. She was treated for a scratched cornea. But then the next morning, she woke up unable to see out of that eye at all. And eventually it would heal. But for several days, yes, she had no vision in that eye. And then David told her the ghost man was very amused by this because he had caused it. Oh, OK. So here's the blind. Here's the blindness. The yeah, temporary blindness. blindness. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to like rain on anybody's parade, but these are less believable for me. And even like you were saying it, the ghost travels all the way across town. Mm -hmm. OK. The whole advantage to being a ghost is that you can be discreet and like you can just kind of probably, I'm assuming, I'm assuming here, you can kind of go through walls, you can do all that fun stuff. So why, why knock on the door? Why, well, that's why how, knock that's on the how they, that's how they announce themselves. They have to knock on the door? Is that like ghost that's, code? That's one of the ways, yeah. Okay, I missed and that part. And first of all, like, 
Well, you have to understand, and we're going to talk do, about it a little towards do, the end. Do that sounds so like what you have to understand. To it's not a normal ghost, right? They keep calling him a ghost man, but there's a difference between a ghost, which is a restless spirit of somebody who's passed away, and a demonic entity. What they're going to figure out, and what they don't know at the time, is they're dealing with a demonic entity, not a ghost. Now, what a demonic entity wants to do is not necessarily remain like obscure. He wants to scare the shit out of you. He wants to let you know that he can get to you anywhere you are. And the whole and whatever happened to staying in the house? I thought they had to stay at the house that they were like not demonic entities. And no, no that's not anywhere. that's not true. By the way, ghosts don't have to stay at the house where they are. You no. Because why would he like torture the woman that was in the Newtown house before him? And now he's like, he didn't like her enough. So he's moving on to the kids. Like what? I don't know. Well, the woman, Michelle moved out. Yeah. Michelle moved out. So yeah. he's like, but why didn't he move with her? Why? He's, uh, he's attached to David now. He just over, over Michelle on to David. Well, but he David's... wants, he wants somebody's soul. And what's easier to get a soul from than an 11 year old boy? Okay. All right. All right. Listen. The whole point of, of allegedly the whole point of like a demonic entity, they want to possess you. They want to use you in order to possess you. They have to break you mentally, physically. Sometimes they have to literally break you. So, well, yeah, they start by scaring you. They start by letting you know, like, I'm here and I can get you and, you know, I have powers and I'm in control. So just I just want to say real quick, I just want to say real quick, I hope you all are appreciating this because we love to be objective and take all theories uh, as serious as, as we can as far as like, hey, listen, is it possible? And I know I get some of the comments where it's like the, the everything's, it's possible, Derek, that's my quote, right? It's possible. So uh, I'm approaching this one with an open mind. And I'm trying, I'm trying here. I just, I just hope you guys appreciate this. Like where you hear what this episode has been about most of this, you know, most of tonight. So just, yeah, we're, we're here. We're talking about demonic entities that can travel from house to house and are poking people in the eye <laughs> when they get mad at them. Well, not necessarily poking people in the eye. They're Poked making the eye. these things happen. Scratch their or, cornea. Or maybe they... They can see the future so they know what's going to happen and they use it to like psychologically oh. psych you out. I don't know. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So on July 4th, the family began referring to David's terrorizer as the beast, no longer the ghost man. Because That's Debbie had, name. well, Debbie had once said, oh, this this dude's a beast. And the, the man had corrected her through David saying, no, I'm not a beast. I'm the beast. And that day, the family tried to escape the chaos by attending a 4th of July barbecue and David knew that the ghost man, a.k.a. the beast, had been trying to find a way into the house. But Judy, his mother, had sprinkled holy water all over. And this seemed to be preventing him from getting in, at least for the time being. But when they arrived home from the barbecue that night, David refused to leave the car and go inside. And when Arnie came out and asked him what was wrong, why don't you go inside, David informed him gravely the man had gotten inside. He had found a way in through the attic, and he was now waiting for David to get him. Eventually, David's father, Carl Sr., came out, and as fathers do, he was like, enough. I don't believe in this shit. Get your ass in the house, or I'm going to beat it kind of thing. You know, it was Ooh. the 80s. And uh, obviously, David ended up going inside. But that night, around 1030, while the family sat watching television in the living room, they once again heard three knocks on the front door. When Judy opened the door, no one was there. Yeah, but a why? Few why? <laughs> why? <laughs> but a few Maybe minutes later— wind. A few minutes later, everyone heard scratching sounds that seemed to be coming from the inside of the walls. And they all quieted down to listen to this. And as they were being quiet and listening, a massive boom came from the attic above them, shaking the house. And this was followed by the sound of footsteps. Now, this continued for hours. The scratching, the footsteps, random thumps. But when Arnie took a flashlight into the attic and looked around, he found nothing. He found no one. I'm going to tell you, I uh, as I'm sitting here, I'm finding this less and less believable, but I will admit that as I was about to interject right here and be like, you know what? That sounds, I'm not buying it. Like I thought these, I thought these spirits could travel. If they could travel, why don't they just come here right now? And I'm like, I'm not challenging oh, yeah. no one. Oh, dude. I'm not, ch I'm not challenging say, no one. I was about to say, keep, keep uh, up with your sassiness and you're going to hear scratching inside your walls the tonight, beast my could friend. Be here. I'm, I'm in this whole warehouse by myself exactly. right now. How like not the that? place you want to challenge a demon. So my point being, as much as I'm finding it hard to follow and as far to tr hard to track, I still ain't willing to just like 
call its bluff. <laughs> I mean, like I'm sitting here like, you know what? It's a little hard to, to believe, but yeah, no, I'm not going to go there. Why are you looking around right now like you hear something? Don't do that. Derek, do not do that. Derek, the man says, doubt him again. Bella comes downstairs right now and opens your door and goes, he said to tell Derek to be nice. <laughs> like out of nowhere, cutting this episode, stopping it, not recording it. Eject, no episode for this week of Crime Weekly. Doubt him Done. again and he'll show you. Imagine that he just, she just knocks on the door. The man said that Derek should be nicer. <laughs> The man said that Derek should stick to police work. Yeah. <laughs> and I would. <laughs> like, you are right. Wow. Dude. Wow. Listen. All right. Yeah. Let's, let's take a break. Let's yes. take a break. You go check your walls and uh, we'll be right back. <laughs> well, it's official. Fall is here. And if you're like me, you're settling back into much busier routines with the kids at school and spare time filled with volleyball practices and seasonal activities, your home may be sitting empty and vulnerable. And that's why we recommend Simply Safe Home Security and their revolutionary home monitoring innovation, 24-7 live guard protection. It's designed to help stop crime in real time. Now, if an intruder breaks into your home, Simply Safe professional monitoring agents can actually see, speak to, and deter them through Simply Safe's new smart alarm wireless indoor camera. I love Simply Safe because I think everybody should have some kind of security system. And honestly, I haven't found one that's easier to use, easier to set up than Simply Safe. 24 7 Live Guard protection is made possible by the new Smart Alarm Wireless Indoor Camera, available with a Fast Protect monitoring plan. The new Smart Alarm Indoor Camera is the only indoor security camera that can trigger the alarm and instantly deter intruders with a built in siren. It has a physical privacy shutter to provide protection when you need it and privacy when you want it. And 24-7 Live Guard Protection and the new Smart Alarm Indoor Camera work seamlessly as part of the Simply Safe system to keep your whole home safe from break-ins, fires, floods, and more. And you can install Simply Safe your way. You can do it in yourself in about 30 minutes, or you can have a Simply Safe expert set it up for you. Either way, it's very easy to protect your home. Uh, basically, once you have it set up, which is an easy process, it's super easy to just keep running. And if you already have Simply Safe, their new 24-7 uh, Live Guard Protection and the Smart Alarm Indoor Camera will fit in perfectly. So we love Simply Safe. We think home security is super important. And Derek's going to tell you how you can check them out for yourself. That's right. As a police officer, unfortunately, I've investigated way too many breaking and enterings. And the, I can tell you as a tool, as an investigator, having a surveillance system after the fact uh, increases the solve rate exponentially, but it also serves as a, as a deterrent so it doesn't happen to you in the first place. So for a limited time, get 20% off your new system when you sign up for the Fast Protect monitoring. Visit simplysafe.com slash crime weekly. That's simplysafe.com slash crime weekly. There's no safe like Simply Safe. All right. So on July 5th, the family woke up drowning in sweat. Now, Connecticut at that time was experiencing a heat wave, but overnight, the air conditioning unit had stopped working. So Carl Sr. went down to the basement to inspect the damage to see if he could repair it. But he found that the unit was in perfect working condition. It had just been turned off by someone, but no one in the house admitted to doing that. And why would anybody in the house admit to doing that? It was over 90 degrees. It was on this day that 11-year-old David began to be physically assaulted by the dark force that now inhabited his home. It started when his mother, Judy, began asking him questions about the beast. And when Carl began to answer, his head was suddenly snapped to the side, as if he'd been slapped, and a dark red welt began to rise on his cheek. The more Judy screamed and begged the thing to stop hitting her son, the worse David got it, until finally, gasping from the floor, unable to move, David begged his mother to stop asking questions and to stop addressing the beast. That night, as David lay in bed afraid to sleep, he heard the sound of slow breathing in the air around him, followed by a voice calling his name. David said the voice began to speak to him, promising whatever he wanted in exchange for one thing. The beast told David that he would go away and leave him alone forever if David were willing to give him this one small thing something that David didn't even use and wouldn't miss, his soul. The beast warned David that if he denied him this, he would never leave. He would stay and torment him and his family, and he would bring others 
who are far more nefarious and far less patient than he was. Despite these dire warnings, David refused to relinquish his soul, and he claimed that after a moment of silence, a red light began to glow and grow in the center of his bedroom. And while this happened, David could hear the sound of people screaming in pain and terror. He could hear the sounds of hell itself. Suddenly, a creature appeared before him. It was the creature he had seen the old man turn into, but he had only seen this before in his head. Now he was seeing it in front of him. The thing had red scaly skin, a man's body, clawed hands, and cloven feet. And as he watched, David could see the shadowy outlines of two more figures appearing on either side of the beast. David began to scream, bringing his parents running to his bedside, and within minutes, everyone in the house was awake and in David's room, watching in horror as he was beaten by invisible hands for the rest of the night. They would later report that David's head snapped back and forth. He was knocked off his feet as he was slapped repeatedly until his face was swollen and red. And any time he tried to sleep, David was cruelly awoken by the beast and his two new friends, who David described as both being tall and thin with wiry arms and stubby claw-like fingers. They both had red skin, humanoid features, cloven feet, and horns protruding from their foreheads, but one had a bullet hole in his forehead, while the other had a knife sticking out of his chest. And so these are, and this is all accounts from from all of them. It's not just David. He's David's obviously explaining what he was mm-hmm. seeing that yeah. they couldn't see, yeah. but everyone experienced this quote-unquote assault that took place. Yes. Okay. Well, definitely Arnie, Debbie, and Judy. Judy, yep. Okay. Yeah. They saw it and they're saying, hey, listen, we don't know what was happening, but we can tell you his neck was snapping back and forth. He w- it looked like he was being beaten. Yeah, and, and Judy obvious- was freaking out, right? Because this is her kid. Yep. And obviously and- David is explaining it after the fact of what was happening to him in that moment. I'm assuming when he was feeling better, he explained what had happened to him. Yeah, when whenever he could talk. But, you know, that night, th- these things would always subside by the time the sun rose. But that night he couldn't do much talking. Um, because every time he talked or tried to explain, he'd just get beaten, allegedly. I wonder if this had, or if people on the outside, I don't want to get too far ahead, but you had said earlier that that um, David had some learning disabilities, correct? Yes. So A I slight if it, learning disability, yeah. Yeah, so I I ever wonder if someone contributed this behavior to that, where it was like, ah, he's not, It's this is something, this is connected to what we've already diagnosed. I wonder. I mean, I don't know many kids with a learning disability that do this. No, I don't either. I'm just saying you could see how doctors, especially during this time, would say, oh, yeah, this is a behavioral thing. Possibly. Yeah. Like he's lying. He's making making it up. up. Yeah. He's making it up for attention. So over the next several weeks, anyone who lived in that house had no choice but to believe that something beyond their control or understanding was happening. They would find their belongings knocked down or destroyed. Lights flashed on and off with no explanation. The footsteps in the attic and the scratching in the walls continued. And the assaults on David became worse as well, with David one night screaming that his assailant had a gun before he stopped cold and dropped to the ground as if he'd been shot. On July 9th, Judy Glatzel went to St. Joseph's Church in Brookfield, where she and her family attended church every Sunday. And she spoke to Father Dennis, the pastor, and explained what was happening. Now, Father Dennis knew there were several logical explanations for what David was claiming, you know, like he's making it up or maybe he has a mental health issue, something like that. But he had to know more and investigate further before he would even entertain the possibility that dark forces were at play. Father Dennis spoke to David himself, trying to figure out if there was some psychiatric aspects at hand or if David just had a wild imagination. And he found David to be believable. He didn't feel that David was making things up. He found David to seem to be truly afraid and, uh, you know, in, in, in fear that, that this was going to keep happening every single night. So before he left, Father Dennis sprinkled some holy water and blessed the house. Now, the blessing seemed to work short term at least. Uh, Everyone slept peacefully that night with no interruptions except for Arnie Johnson, who later told his fiance Debbie that he had not slept a wink due to the distinct feeling that there was something in the room with them standing at his bedside watching him all night. The Glatzels would have their hopes crushed that Father Dennis had taken care of the problem when the following night the supernatural events started back up with a fervor, and David reported seeing more and more figures crawling out of hell to torture him. When all was said and done, 43 of these dark entities had entered the house, and they were not there to play. 
The following morning, Judy called Father Dennis again and told him things had gotten worse. They needed help. He promised to contact the Bridgeport Diocese, but in the meantime, Father Dennis suggested that Judy get into contact with Ed and Lorraine Warren, who he described as psychic investigators. But in reality, I mean, technically, Lorraine Warren was the only one who had psychic abilities, allegedly. Yeah, she was the one who was also able to come, like communicate with the other side. or Right. So she'd be known as a medium, I guess. Yeah, medium. Yeah. Uh, this whole thing, it's just, I'm trying to put myself in a situation where if we're taking everything at face value, this is really occurring in this home where, from what you've said, this family didn't have like an over... They weren't like overly religious where this would be something where they would immediately go to this. They seem pretty pragmatic. I mean, what do you what do you what do you mean by overly religious? Like I feel like there's certain religions where everything I'll give an example. So Lori Vallow, mm -hmm. Chad Daybell, we're mm -hmm. talking in that case. When those kids are doing something or not doing something, it's due to the fact that they're light or dark spirits. Oh, like, you mean crazy? They didn't <laughs> seem crazy. <laughs> I'm being politically correct here. What I'm saying is like they're not they don't seem like the type where everything ties back to religion or, you know, the afterlife or the current situations we're in as far as like spirits on this earth, dark and evil, you know, good spirits, bad spirits, uh, I guess demons. They didn't seem like that type of family before this where if there was something going wrong in your life, it was because you weren't following religion. You know what I mean? Where everything comes back to how your your relationship with you, whoever that higher authority is for you. They didn't seem like that. They seemed pretty reasonable people and especially Arnie where it was more like it didn't seem like they were saying automatically that the reason this was happening to David was because he he wasn't following their faith or anything. It didn't seem like they were they were in that they were that severe or extreme, I should say. No, but they were religious. They went to church every Sunday. And I mean, that's fine. You were raised religious. You went to church and everything. I right? mean, I was raised Catholic and I went to church and I did the whole thing, but I never considered myself a super religious person. I, I believed in a higher authority, which is part of the reason I didn't always do things that I wanted to do behind my mom's back, mm -hmm. but I was never overly religious. But yeah, I mean, we had, we had a structure that we followed for sure. And so, you know, because I, I grew up going to church, I went to a Catholic school, you know, that, um, uh, Part of the religious teachings in Christianity is the fact that these dark forces do exist, right? They're taught to us in the same way that that the presence and in, in the, the existence of God is taught to us. If the forces of good exist, they must be accompanied by the forces of evil. So I will say that I, I believe religious people who go to church every Sunday, who, you know, read the Bible, who follow these things devoutly, they don't have to be overly religious, but they would be more prone to believe that there was sort of some sort of like demonic or dark presence at work because we're taught that that those things exist. Yeah, no, I agree with you. That's kind of what I was getting to where it's like if you're looking for an explanation as to why something is going good or something is bad, your family dynamic is to to relate it back to your religion. Oh, where we've been praying hard, we've been going to church, God is rewarding us. Or mm -hmm. if, you're, if something goes wrong in your life or someone gets sick, it means because you're not following God's plan or God's structure, you know, structure and you're not doing what you should be doing. You're not going to church enough. You're not praying enough. You're not doing the things that your religion has instructed you to do. The Bible has instructed you to do. I don't feel like that's what they, the, the, the route they were going Although I would agree with you, like the fact that their response is to get a priest involved does mm -hmm. tell you, does give you some insight into the idea. That well, I mean, that Jesus, wouldn't you if somebody was like, I'm the beast and he had horns growing out of his head? So for me, I'm more going to a psychologist at that point, a doctor. Honestly, honestly, but that's just the way I am. And I'm not saying that's Even wrong or right. Even if you experienced right. things like you heard that all of you did, you'd go to a psychologist. You're no, all experiencing I, like a mass fair delusion. Point, fair point. If I'm in the room. And my son or my, you know, br brother-in-law or whatever, getting, whatever like, the dynamic is. by invisible hands in front of you. Right. And is saying this. And then yeah. at the same time, I'm being shoved in the back and I turn around and nobody's there. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm you with hear you. footsteps we, in the attic. and well, well, first off, I don't care how much, I don't care if I have to live on the streets. I'm getting out of that house. I don't care right. how much it's costing me. Right. No amount of money is worth that. Right. But yeah, if I'm personally experiencing it or... Everyone in the house is experiencing it. People I trust, people I value. My, you know, my. Were they married at the time, Debbie? No, they weren't. They were no, just together. No, not yet. Yeah, not yet. Um, fiance. So it was one of the, the engaged, right? Yeah. 
So that if she's saying it as well as the adult, I might say, all right, there might be something here. But um, yeah, overall, it does seem like they were pretty reasonable people. But I, I have a feeling there will be people in our comments because we're all, as you should, we're all kind of ripping this apart, tearing it apart, try, be, being skeptics to a certain degree. And I'm, I'm pretty certain that there are going to be some people in the comments, understandably so, who are saying, no, these people were probably, I don't want to use the word extremist, but like more religious than many people. And that's why, because of their beliefs, they were able to buy into this and justify what was happening through their religion, right? They, they created this because of their beliefs. And I mean, I you know what, if you say, put it in the comments, it's not wrong. I mean, you're entitled to that. I have to say, if I'm not like, obviously, you know, I'm not super religious at yep. all. But if stuff like that started happening, that that's the first thing I would think of, right? Because there's always the possibility. We don't know what's out there. We don't know what's on the universe. We don't know what it all means. So there's there's obviously the possibility that there's evil forces out there that can inhabit homes or or people and make them do crazy things or make crazy things happen that are unexplainable. Yeah, if all of this stuff was happening and I witnessed it, that would be my. I, what else could it be? <laughs> what you're else calling could it be? a priest? Yes. So I'm calling a priest. Yes. If my son is seeing a man with horns and red skin, and I'm hearing things, and I'm seeing him being thrown around by invisible hands, and I'm hearing knocks at the door, and nobody's there, and you know, all crazy th scratching in the walls and thumps upstairs that are shaking the whole house, but no one's there, and yeah. Uh, couldn't that yeah. be explained by, you know, pipes in the wall? And like, couldn't there be explanations for all I mean, of it? You, I think you can tell the difference between pipes in the wall and like damn footsteps walking around upstairs. <laughs> yeah. And then I wonder about like your mind playing tricks on you. I We were talking in, uh, during the break about being at this warehouse and hearing noises down in the basement. I was by myself packing for Crime Con mm -hmm. and I heard a couple of noises and I'm pretty sure it was, it was a rat, <laughs> but- at that point, I was already down there with a flashlight in my hand, my little cell phone flashlight. And I was like, probably a rat. I'm not sticking around to find out. I'm out. Mm -hmm. Get it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I feel like your fears can play on you as well, where like they can start to consume you, where your mind plays tricks on you and you start to see and hear things that aren't necessarily there. But because you're nervous and scared, it magnifies those those fears. I don't know. Not to this extent. If what okay. they're saying is true, not to this extent. So uh, let me ask you right out then. At this point, do you believe what you're what you're spitting out to the to the Crime Weekly fans over here that this is true, that this happened? I don't know if it's true, but oh, if, it, if it's true and what they're saying was true, yes, I would call a priest. <laughs> okay, so you're saying Absolutely. if it's true, you're calling a priest. So if tomorrow Bella says that this this man in the brown suit hit her and she has a she has a smack and on her I'm face. And I'm seeing or... her being hit and then I'm seeing welts appear on her face. Yeah. <laughs> I'm she calling could be hit, a priest. She could be hitting herself. But I'm watching her and she's not. Okay, okay. So you're saying that like she's slapping yes. her. She's okay. Way down in the comments everyone below. I really I'm really interested. <laughs> I feel like and we're playing two sides here, which is great. I'm not at all saying it is true. I have no idea. I wasn't there. If what they're relating is 100% true and happened the way they're relating it, yeah, I'm calling a priest, man. Yeah, calling a yes. priest. Call, or I'm calling Ghostbusters, but you do your thing. The, you them too. They can come too. Adam I'm Lorraine calling. Warren, the whole gang can come. Anybody who can help, all yeah. right? I'm going to build a team around me and I'm going to have everything covered. Scientists, psychiatrists, priests, demonologists, all of them, all right? I'm smudging. I'm, <laughs> I'm freaking, you know. The incense nah. or the- nah. It's smudging. Smudging? Is that I what it's called? I do that every day, by the way. Oh, Jesus, please stop. I, I actually am, based on the video clip we saw earlier in this episode or heard, if you're listening on audio, um, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing more about Ed and Lorraine. But before we get into that, let's take our final break. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. You can skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. 
Dinner time can be the most stressful time in my household because it always feels like an afterthought. And a crazy schedule can make it easy to fall back into your dinner time recipe rut. You can keep mealtime exciting with over 40 recipes to choose from every week, so there's always something delicious to discover with HelloFresh. With so many in-season fall ingredients, you'll taste all the freshness of fall in every bite of HelloFresh's chef-crafted recipes. Produce travels from the farm to your door for peak ripeness that you can taste. And HelloFresh does all the shopping and meal planning for you. Ingredients arrive at your doorstep, pre-portioned and ready to cook, along with pictured step-by-step recipe cards, which makes it super easy and almost impossible to mess up. And honestly, this this feature is what I love best about HelloFresh. The fact that everything is pre-portioned out for you, that you have only and exactly what you need for each recipe, so there's no food waste at all. No food waste is a big thing for me. And the fact that literally you you could be completely exhausted and not using your brain at all and follow the recipe cards with the step-by-step instructions in the pictures and still provide yourself or your family with an amazing and delicious meal is great. And we all know that HelloFresh takes the hassle out of mealtime, but did you know it can also save you money because HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery store shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout. And that means less stress in your day and more money in your pocket. And honestly, at the end of the day, when you don't have to run to the grocery store, uh, you don't have to order food and have it delivered and, and pay an arm and a leg for that. You don't have to order DoorDash and pay an arm and a leg for that. And you are paying less money and saving time. What is better than that? So we love HelloFresh. Honestly, I've been cooking with it since very early in 2020. It's a lifesaver for me on a lot of weeknights. I know Derek likes it too. I like that I can bring my whole family in, that they always like what I prepare, even if they think they won't. And I just in general think that the food is amazing. The produce is really fresh. The meat that they give you is always very good. So everything ends up tasting good and it was easy to make. And I think that's awesome. So if you're interested in trying HelloFresh, Derek's going to tell you how you can check them out for yourself. That's right. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 Crime Weekly and use our code 50 Crime Weekly for 50% off plus free shipping. One more time, that's HelloFresh.com slash 50 Crime Weekly and use our code 50 Crime Weekly for 50% off plus free shipping. Go check them out, guys. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Wouldn't it be great if you had the right wardrobe to match your evolving lifestyle, whether you're picking up a new activity, looking for maternity wear, or simply bored of your old choices, the stylist at Stitch Fix makes sure you always have something to wear. And honestly, for me, it's always the change in season where I'm looking for a few new pieces that I can add to my existing wardrobe to sort of spice up my wardrobe when a new season comes. So I really love Stitch Fix for that. Stitch Fix is the best way to shop new styles and brands, you can think of them as your style partner. Your stylist will learn about your tastes and collaborate with you on looks that you'll love without breaking the bank. All you have to do is share your style, sizes, and budget with a quick style quiz, and Stitch Fix sends you five items in a fix right to your door. With your choices in mind and sizes from extra small to 3XL, they will find your perfect fit. You can try everything on at home, you keep what you like, and send back the rest. Shipping and returns are always free. They have over 1,000 brands and styles to choose from, so no matter what season of life you're in, Stitch Fix has you covered. And then you can simply order a refresh as needed, or set it and forget it with regular fixes, you're completely in control. And over time, Stitch Fix and their season style experts will match you with greater precision to perfect pieces for you based on your likes and your dislikes from what you've gotten from previous fixes. It's so easy, it's seamless, and it's really awesome. So um, I know Derek has personally tried Stitch Fix, and I want to hear what his experience is with it because I love it, but I don't know. How are you feeling? Yeah, I've been trying it for a little while now, and I had an interesting encounter with Stitch Fix recently where Got my new fix in and liked all the clothes, kept them all. But the shoes, I liked them so much, but I already had a pair, very (laughs) similar. So I sent them back. They give you this bag right inside the box. You throw the shoes in there. It's all prepaid for. You send it back and they email you almost immediately saying like, hey, we noticed you didn't keep the shoes. Can we try something different? Sent me out a different pair of shoes, similar style, because I said, hey, I like them. These are the reasons why I'm sending them back. So they sent me out something that was very similar, but a different color. 
keeping those two. So it's been a great experience all the way around. Stitch Fix gets me and they'll get you too. Try today at stitchfix.com slash crime weekly and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Once again, that's stitchfix.com slash crime weekly. One more time, stitchfix.com slash crime weekly. Okay, so anyone who's familiar with scary movies or the supernatural knows who Ed and Lorraine Warren were. By 1980, they'd already made quite the name for themselves. Ed Warren was born on September 7th, 1926 in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and he claims to have grown up in a house that was haunted. He'd served in the U.S. Navy during World War II before pursuing a career as a paranormal investigator. Lorraine Warren was 16 years old when she met Ed, and she'd also been born in Bridgeport on January 31st, 1927. Lorraine claimed to have been able to see and communicate with spirits from the time that she was a young girl, and she would become instrumental in paranormal investigations because allegedly she was able to use her psychic abilities to gather information about hauntings and possessions. Lorraine was also a lifelong devout Catholic, and she felt that her faith in God was essential to their work, especially when dealing with demonic entities. Together, the couple founded the New England Society for Psychic Research in 1952. In the basement of this research center, the couple began creating an occult museum of sorts with satanic objects and artifacts that they picked up along their travels, which is something I would never collect, honestly, but... Okay, (laughs) like I'm definitely not going to bring all of those things together. And listen, I've been to Zach Bagans Museum in Vegas. When we were in Vegas, I went. And let me tell you, I don't know if they're pumping stuff in there to make you feel lightheaded, to make you feel out of sorts, but the air feels heavier. It's harder to breathe. You definitely feel completely weird and out of out of it the entire time you're in that place. So I will say that. And and there that that place is just filled with these kinds of objects and and stuff like that. It's it was a super fun tour and I really enjoyed it, but damn. You you mentioned his name before with with Zach and that you were a big fan of his and that you wanted to do something like that down the road. Didn't you like say you would love to go on one of those shows? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Wouldn't you? I mean, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> no, 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 I wouldn't. I told you there was an I, there was a show that got thrown around. This was a while ago. You probably don't remember this where I'm not going to say the network or anything, but they wanted to do a show where it was going to be haunted mansions that had crimes occur in them. So cool. And they wanted me as the investigator to go with a medium to investigate the crimes that happened in there. And I was like, pass. Hard pass. Derek, do it. No, this was a while ago. The opportunity's not even there. The show never got off the ground. We can make it. No. Nope. I'm good. You're not a medium. We can bring a different medium with us every time. Nope. Do the show. You can have the idea. It's yours. Kill it. Derek, we should do it. Nope. Okay. You're so lame. So lame. Anyways, listen. There's something that's in Zach Bagan's museum that used to be in the Warren's Uh, occult museum, and that is a doll named Annabelle. So according to the Warrens, in 1968, a young nurse who owned this doll reported that it started moving, and the doll would be in a different position every time she would leave and enter the room, and she was not the one moving it. So very soon after, this nurse and her roommate began finding messages written on parchment paper, which was something they didn't even have in their house, And these messages were like saying things like, help me, help us, stuff like that. So when the doll, which would later become named Annabelle, when it began moving from room to room and leaking blood, Ed and Lorraine Warren were brought in to investigate. And they concluded that the doll was possessed by the spirit of a little girl named Annabelle Higgins. Now, the Warrens believed that whatever was inside the doll was searching for a human to possess, so they took it from the young nurse and they ended up putting it behind glass in their occult museum with a do not open sign prominently displayed on her case. And when I saw her at Zach Baggins Museum, we were instructed very clearly, like, do not make eye contact with this doll. Don't look at this doll too long. Like, just don't do it, you know? And then they and they they build you up so much. And then they say, oh, does anybody want to approach the doll? And there was a few people, man, who were brave enough to approach the doll. And I got to tell you, I was not one of them. It was not me. I did not approach that damn doll. Nope. 
Not at all. Finally, some common sense. I mean, I have common sense in these in these scenarios. So I want to I want to get close, but not too close. I want to see it with my own eyes and, and figure out how I feel about it. But I'm not trying to really tempt fate. So this case was also sealed with a binding spell because according to Ed and Lorraine, as they drove Annabelle to her new home, the brakes in their car failed several times. The Annabelle case is what actually brought Ed and Lorraine Warren into the spotlight, causing them to be honestly the go-to source for anyone who felt they were being haunted by dark forces, such as the Perone family, whose own terrifying saga became the inspiration for the original Conjuring movie. In January of 1971, Carolyn and Roger Perone, along with their five children, moved into a Rhode Island farmhouse. But when strange occurrences started happening, like the bed levitating, Carolyn researched the house and discovered that many people had lost their lives in it due to mysterious circumstances, suicide, outright murder. And of course, the Warrens are best known for their involvement in the Amityville house after Ronald DeFeo Jr. murdered his entire family in the New York home in the fall of 1974. Two years later, George and Kathy Lutz and their two children moved in only to be tormented by what they believed was a demonic spirit. Now, although the Warrens have had their share of skeptics, it's a fact that they were sometimes asked to assist in police investigations that involve satanic ritualistic murder, and they were also consulted by the Catholic Church in matters of hauntings and possessions multiple times. They have also been present at many church-sanctioned exorcisms. So the Warrens had worked with Father Dennis from St. Joseph's in the past. He trusted them, and he felt that they might be able to provide some help to the Glatzel family while he investigated and began the long process of getting the diocese involved in you know, what was happening with David Glatzel, which apparently took a ton of like red tape and paperwork and multiple requests. And it was like, this is not something that's going to happen overnight. We're not going to be able to get somebody from the Catholic Church in here to investigate thoroughly until we go through all of this this whole process, which I appreciate. But at the same time, if you are dealing with an 11-year-old who's possessed, maybe there's some urgency there. Yeah, a little know, sense like, of urgency there. We want to fix this sooner than later. So Ed and Lorraine Warren first heard the name David Glatzel on July 13th, 1980. It had been 11 days since David had fallen victim to whatever powerful forces had targeted him, but to the Glatzels, who were living in a constant state of sleep deprivation and terror, it felt like 11 years. When they got the call from Judy, Lorraine claimed she'd already predicted something bad was going to happen in Brookfield. The previous week, she and Ed had been driving through the area when she sensed a sudden wave of evil near Brookfield Center. And at that time, she let her husband and their assistant know that they should expect a call about a dangerous case in Brookfield soon. On July 14th, the Warrens went to the Glatzel house for the first time, bringing along a friend of theirs who was also a medical doctor and the medical examiner for the county, Dr. Anthony Giangrasso. We went to the house this hot night. I can remember like the steam and the moisture coming off the ground. It was a weird night when we arrived there. First, Ed tripped going up the steps into the house. And Dr. Jim Grasso made kind of a laughing comment. And he tripped and fell, too. So the Warrens did bring a doctor, a medical doctor, with them. And inside, the doctor, Dr. Gian Grasso, examined David and found him to be physically and mentally fine, as far as he could tell. And when the Warrens spoke to the 11-year-old, they found what he was saying to be believable. He spoke with confidence. His story stayed consistently the same, even the small details. And he didn't change anything based on questions he was asked or information given to him. Ed and Lorraine also felt that David's words were consistent with their extensive knowledge about this kind of supernatural activity. And if even a little bit of what David was saying was true, he and his family were in grave danger. David told them that most of the entities were in the attic at that moment because they liked it hot, which is why they probably had turned off the air conditioning unit the week before. But the main force, the beast, was in the rocking chair in the living room. He was listening to them, and he did not like that Ed and Lorraine were there. So actually, at this point, um, Ed Warren claims that he kind of confronted this demon, and he was like, oh, I don't believe that this thing is here because the beast was saying he was Satan and the devil. And Ed was like, oh, if you're Satan and the devil, why are you messing with a, a little 11 year old boy? I don't believe this. And then according to Ed Warren, the entity made the entire floor underneath Ed's feet shake. And Ed was like, oh, OK, like, I see you can do some stuff, you know, but he was kind of convinced that if not the devil or Satan, some powerful demonic force was there. 
The Warrens would later claim that by August 6th, the case had morphed from being that of a potential haunting to one of full-blown possession. And David Glatzel was regularly inhabited by one or more of the 43 demonic forces that had set their sights on him. David began swearing at people, using language that was shocking from such a young boy, calling them names, attacking them. Um, You know, his mother would say, (laughs) I'm sorry, it's not funny, but His mother would say something like, David, don't say that. And he'd look at her and he'd be like, shut up, you slut, you know, stuff like that. Um, That was quite shocking. Or, you know, his sister Debbie would walk by and David would say, oh, you got a nice ass on you there. Things like that, that normally he wouldn't say. And David started to not resemble himself at all, as if his very facial features were changing. Even his voice sounded different. The Warrens claimed that preternatural manifestation happens in a five-step progression. Step one is encroachment, or the permission stage, where a negative spirit is given access to a human being either through voluntary means, like performing satanic rituals, or involuntary means, like a curse. Stage two is infestation, where negative spirits physically enter the homes or lives of humans and cause problems. Now, here's going to it's going to answer your question from earlier about knocking on the door. Ed Warren stated, quote, for some reason, the infesting entity presents itself only after making an obvious, comprehensible warning of its rival, such as three audible knocks at the door, end quote. So if this infestation is not recognized and stopped, the supernatural activity will intensify and lead to stage three oppression, where the entity seeks to overwhelm and subdue the will of the person that they want to possess. Oppression can take two forms, external, where the entity tries to break a person through manipulation of the physical environment, and internal, where the entity interferes and manipulates a person's thoughts and emotions, which leads that person to, you know, behaving differently. The fourth stage is the possession of the human, where the human spirit is displaced from the body and replaced by the inhuman spirit. And then the fifth and final step is death. Since the motive of the entity is to use the human and its body for its will, but ultimately leave that person dead. The Warrens felt that David was well past the possession stage, and if something didn't happen soon, he would not survive long. Lorraine Warren said, quote, Once possession set in, the Glatzel home became the scene of constant pandemonium. With eight people living in the house, each one was affected by the event in his or her own way. Sorrow, depression, and tears became a way of life, but it wasn't just David causing all the trouble. Once things got going, this negative force began to overwhelm young Carl, too. When the entity possessed David, it would invariably attack someone physically, and there young Carl would be right in the middle of the fray, laughing hysterically and cheering it on. He'd even join in the beatings. It was horrible, inconceivable. Both women were battered. David was battered and marked. Alan and Jason were battered. And Arnie was not just battered. The thing in David was actually out to get him. Thank God Arnie was there. He was the peacemaker. Other than Mr. Glatzel, who was working most of the time, Arnie was the only person physically big enough to put up useful resistance. And Arnie was never afraid of this thing. He saw it for what it was. If he hadn't been present in the house, the Glatzels will tell you, someone would definitely have been killed. The beast was the spirit of death, and Arnie Cheyenne Johnson was constantly frustrating its attempts to take the life of a family member. Is it any wonder the thing launched a vendetta against him? End quote. Again, Arnie, Arnie seems like the reasonable person where he's acknowledging what's taking place, but he doesn't fear it. Hmm. You know, so it's one of those situations. Or he might fear it, but. He fears it, but he has enough courage. That's what courage is really, right? Like right. to be afraid, but still move forward. To be brave in the face of something that you're afraid of. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, and And I think he also had grown up being responsible for the people around him for so long that he felt like, if not me, who? Yeah, he's got to be a protector, you know? Yeah. Even if this isn't, I don't know, we're, we we still got a ways to go. But regardless, the fact that clearly David was going through something. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, the belief by David and who everybody else is that the spirit is overtaking David. And the truth is, you don't know if it's true or not. And yet to still react that way and to be present and to be the person who's going to be the quote unquote quote hero, I guess here, and just really take this thing on, whatever it is. A lot of respect for Arnie. It's it's interesting to think about this. You wouldn't do it. <laughs> I think if it was someone I cared about and loved, I know I joke, but absolutely I would. What's interesting is remember why we're here. Arnie Johnson horrifically killed someone, murdered mm-hmm. them, mm-hmm. stabbed them twenty times. Mm-hmm. 
And it wasn't too long after this incident. We're talking less than a year. Yeah. So to think that's the person that this episode is titled, you know, Arnie Johnson, the devil made me do it. That's the name of this episode. To think that's what this episode is about. And to think that you're describing this person right now and it's the same guy. Mm -hmm. That's that's a big leap. And the question is, how did we get there? That's honestly what a lot of people said, even during the trial, because he's going to have character witnesses and people who are coming forward and testifying like we've never even seen this guy raise his voice. You know, like we don't get it. Yeah, 19 years old. And not only not only like physical things, have we ever seen signs of this before, but also historically, like has he been someone who has had any type of mental health issue going up to this point? He's 19 years old is a pretty good sample size there. Has he had anything traumatic happen in his life other than this incident with David that could have caused this to be triggered in some way, something he may have experienced or witnessed? Um, those are all things you have to consider. And if you have good character witnesses, no sign of anything that would have derailed him from the path that he was on, then you start to look at alternate theories as far as why how, why this happened. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And unless we can find a motive that would make him angry enough to kill this person. Right. We have to consider it. And again, t- detective hat on. Has he been angry with someone before? And how did he react to that? Nobody could remember a time really when he had been. So there you go. So that's, you know, what would we say earlier? Best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Well, in his past behavior, he doesn't show any sign of it. Yeah, it's weird. It's definitely weird. I will agree with, I will agree with you there. It's definitely weird. Out of character, out of seemingly nowhere. But like, is it possible now that I'm thinking about it? Is it possible he truly thought he had been possessed? Yep. And so he acted out in a way that he thought he would if he was possessed. Almost maybe that's something he wanted to do. But in his right mind, he wouldn't have done it. But he thought he was possessed. So it was almost like he had like been brainwashed or like delusioned to think that he was possessed. And this is what he would do if he was possessed. I don't know. But that's what, and I, that's what I said earlier. There is an element to this where you, you have like a hypochondriac where they hear about an illness or they read about it. And then all of a sudden they have it. And that's a real thing. That's a real thing. When, you know, it's not a real thing that's happening, but it's a real issue in, in your mind where you you convince yourself that suddenly you have whatever ailment you were just, just what you, you were just researching. Where I, you can have people who have anxiety where they make they work themselves up so much they give themselves a panic attack because mm-hmm. they're so stressed out about it. And in reality, on the outside world, externally. There's nothing physically going wrong with them. Mm-hmm. The mind is the most powerful thing we have, and yes. you can it can be great, and it could be it could be your biggest enemy too. Mm-hmm. So, could you have a situation here like you're describing? Absolutely, where this person has witnessed this from this little boy, and has now convinced himself that he's been taken over, and his mind is tricking him. Where just something, he might feel a gust of wind, but now suddenly, instead of it being just what it really is, which is a gust, a of, gust wind, of wind, it's it's an evil spirit passing by him. You know, and there hasn't been anything too over other than the lever- levitating, which is why I asked you about that. But the poking of the eye, the screwdriver in the mattress. You don't think like David being beaten in front of people and like so here's having my marks thing. from that? Here's my thing. This is their observations. Yes. This is their retelling of that story. Yes. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying they're lying. I'm just saying that's their retelling of the story. And that's what I was going to say, too, because so far what we're hearing is the Glatzel side of things. That's correct. We're going to go to trial, which is where we're going to go next week, and we're going to hear what the prosecution has to say, what kind of witnesses they've dug up, what kind of information they've uncovered. And it may tell a different story. Right. And and let's also say that the impartial witnesses that we have now entering this story, Ed and Lorraine, are not impartial. Their whole profession That's is the, based yeah. off this. Yeah. And they've been they've been scrutinized their entire career. So it's in their best interest for this to be real because that's what they make their living off of. So I, I, I can't really take everything they say at face value. Or they, this is what they do for a living. They're entrenched in this. So they see demonic possession everywhere. Because like you said, the mind is a powerful thing. Yeah. Interesting yeah. case, Mrs. Harlow, so far. Thank you very much. It's Miss Harlow to you. <laughs> Actually, it would be Mrs., wouldn't it? Yeah, but it's not my real last name, so... Thanks for sharing my, that with it's everybody. It's my alter. Everyone knows that, but it's like my alter ego, you know, like Sasha Fierce. Yeah. I've told Stephanie before she just she should just go by her real last name, but. Do you know who um, Sasha Fierce is? No. Really? No. Don't. Beyonce. Point taken. Beyonce's alter ego is Sasha Fierce. Did not know that. Anyways, by August, 
And this is August of 1980, just a month after David is allegedly possessed or allegedly visited by the beast. The Bridgeport possession case, which they started calling it, had turned over to the Diocese of Bridgeport. And over the next few months, more than one exorcism would take place. But by October of 1980, the Bridgeport police received a troubling warning from Ed and Lorraine Warren, with police chief John Anderson later saying, quote, we received a call from Ed and Lorraine Warren of Monroe in October 1980. They said they were involved with the family that resided here in Brookfield, that the involvement was pertaining to a demonic possession of someone in the family, and there was the potential for great danger. So this is what I'm saying. The police get a call from the Warrens in October of 1980, and they're like, this kid's possessed. Shit's going to happen. It's going to go bad. And then, you know, then this murder happens in February, a couple months later. So it's not as if Arnie murdered Alan Bono in February of 1981 and then said, oh, shit, I did something I shouldn't have. We got to come up with some defense. And there was witnesses. So like what defense? Because we I can't say I didn't do it because people saw me do it. And that's another thing. He did it in front of people. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like he tried to hide it. It wasn't like he waited till they were alone. He did it in front of people. So it's not as if he did this and then said, oh, I got to figure out a way to like get away with this. Let's say I was possessed. And then let's come up with all this like past evidence to create the story. The Warrens did call the Brookfield police in October of 1980 and say, listen, this kid's possessed and it's really bad. And there is the potential for great danger. So we have that on record. Well, according to the Warrens, the murder of Alan Bono at the hands of Arnie Cheyenne Johnson on February 16th, 1981, was exactly what they'd been trying to warn the police about. But by then, obviously, it was too late. And that's where we're going to pick up next time. Guys, if you like this video, let us know what you think. Like, comment, subscribe. Everyone have a safe night tonight. We'll talk to you soon. Stay safe out there. Bye.